Welcome back again to a wonderful What the Fuck is Cloud Native virtual conference. I hope you guys are like chilling, relaxing, having something to drink, something to nibble on. And I hope you guys are ready for the next speaker. We have Matt Jarvis from SNCC, and he's going to give a wonderful, wonderful talk about my container image has 500 vulnerabilities. Now what? Like, I am just so curious. I'm so interested. And like, I hope you guys are tuned and you can't wait for the next talk. And I want to give it away and over to him. Good afternoon, folks. Um, right, let me get the technology going here. Right. Uh, so this is me. I'm Matt Jarvis. I'm Director of Developer Relations at Sneak. Um, I've been involved in the, the Kubernetes and Cloud Native uh, world for quite a while. I run a whole bunch of, of meetups and also I'm one of the founders of Kubernetes Community Days UK. So when you first start scanning your container images, it can be uh, kind of disconcerting to discover that you might have uh, a huge number of vulnerabilities in your images. Um, this is a scan I did a couple of weeks ago on a vulnerable node image that I built. It's a fairly extreme example, but you can see that this image out of the box is showing us having over 800 vulnerabilities in it. So um, faced with this, a lot of us will just freeze like a rabbit in headlights um, when we're presented with a big list of these CVEs, uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures, uh, particularly if your focus is on uh, application development and not on system administration. Um, what are we supposed to do with this information? Uh, where do we start? Um, I just wanted an image to run my node application in and already I'm facing this uh, gigantic task to make it secure. Well, the most important thing we need to remember is that fixing these things in containers isn't like fixing them in virtual machines or in real hardware. Um, we don't want to get into upgrading individual packages and starting to manage the whole system. We need to understand where vulnerabilities have got into our images uh, before we can think about what strategies we can use to um, remediate them. And what we don't want to do is to have to read through every CVE or to become too versed in the dark arts of system administration. And um, we're looking for solutions which align with the paradigms of containers. So we want repeatability, um, we want efficiency, and as much as possible, we want to stick with the ideas of immutability that come along with how we use containers. So the first thing that's worth understanding in this context is how the images we're using might be constructed. Um, our Docker images are constructed in layers, and those layers are coming from different places. Um, some of them we're creating in our own Docker files, and some of them might be being brought in as part of our build process. So it's likely that we started from a base image in our Docker file, and then we added some of our own things during the build process. Um, perhaps we made some uh, configuration changes for our environment, and then we added our own custom software. And depending on how we construct our Docker file, we'll end up with these things all separated into separate file system layers in our Docker image. And this layering gives us a pretty good analogy in terms of how we could start thinking about vulnerabilities. So let's start by thinking about base images and the best way to think about um, vulnerabilities in the software in them. So um, although we refer to this as our base image, it's likely that the image we're using is also constructed from a parent image, um, which then had software installed into it during its build process. Uh, the parent image itself was then constructed in some way, um, perhaps even from a further parent image or by some kind of root file system building tool. Understanding how the software that we're scanning got into our images in the first place is really the key to deciding on our strategy for minimizing vulnerabilities. So as an example of this, 
Um, let's look at the official Nginx image on Docker Hub. Now, if we look at the, uh, the Docker file for this image, um, we can see that it's based on the uh, Debian Buster Slim image, which then gets software and configuration added to it um, when the Nginx image is built. And in turn, the Debian Buster image is built from another Docker file, which takes an empty scratch image, just an empty file system, and adds a tarball to it. And if we then research how this tarball gets built, it's an output from the Deberotype tool, which is a series of scripts used by the Debian project to build root file systems. So this is obviously the way that Debian do it, but there are different methods by which these things get constructed um, for all the other operating systems, which are typically used as base images. Um, the point of all this is that even when we just look at our base images, the way that software gets into them can be a long and potentially convoluted process. And that can be difficult to follow um, unless you understand all these different paradigms. Now, some people might say you should just use Scratch build your own images starting from scratch. It's basically an empty container. Well, this might work well for compiled language binaries where we don't have any dependencies, um, perhaps Golang or C, for example. But for most other things, you're going to end up being the maintainer for everything that goes into that image. And that can be a very big overhead on an ongoing basis. So. Unless you want to become the maintainer of an entire base image, in most cases, you're going to want to trust an upstream provider for your base images and look to them for fixes to vulnerabilities in that base image that you're using. Don't try to fix upstream issues downstream. As soon as you do this, you become the maintainer. In the long run, the overhead from doing this is likely to be significant. And it's going to require that you track more and more security issues all the time in order to fix them in your deviated version, your forked version, than if you just stuck with the upstream image. So as we saw, to use upstream images, you need to trust the entire chain of build processes that went into the image we're consuming. And that can be difficult to follow clearly sometimes. Uh, but of course, this is no different from how we consume the majority of open source software. And most of the same quality factors that might influence our choices there also apply to base images. Is the software maintained and updated regularly? Is there a broad community of users? Um, are there commercial companies supporting it? And that information is all available to you online. So take your time and investigate what it is that you're actually using. By trusting our upstream image provider, um, we really need to rely on pulling in fixes from upstream by upgrading our base image or by using a different base image that might have less vulnerabilities in it. But picking a base image isn't always as easy as it looks. Um, for example, the official Ruby base image in Docker Hub has lots of vulnerabilities in it and it's very big. Um, this is fairly typical of official language runtime images because by design, they need to be generalized for every use case. They're designed to, if you've got any Ruby application or any Node application, it's going to run in that, in that generic base image. Um, we could look at the slim version. These are smaller, they've got less vulnerabilities, or perhaps we look for another one, but there are lots and lots of tags in the repository. So how do we choose? Well, that generic runtime image is probably not what you want for production use cases. Um, for a start, it's hard to tell which framework version they might be following. So that could change in the future. Um, and you, may not, you might not know that it's changed. Um, but Slim isn't automatically the best, best choice. Uh, you get less vulnerabilities, but then you, you might need to start managing your build dependencies because things aren't installed in Slim. It's got a, a, a much smaller amount of software in it. Um, the best practice for this really is to use multi-stage builds. I'm sure many people are familiar with this by now. Um, we use the bigger, more generic image to do our software builds. And then uh, we copy our build artifacts over into our slim version, 
um, for production deployment. So in this way, we're not having to manage our build dependencies. Those are all in our generic image, but we still get to take advantage of the size and the reduced vulnerabilities of the slim version. Um, note in this example, we're also sticking to specific runtime versions. So we know exactly what runtime environment we're getting, in this case, um, Python 3.8. So we know, and we know that's not going to change um, underneath us. So in terms of choosing our base images, here's some general recommendations. Trust an upstream provider to do the heavy lifting and the vulnerability fixing for you. Uh, they have uh, much bigger teams working on this stuff, and so they're much more likely to be fixing things quickly. Pin your apps to versioned images. Um, at least major, probably minor, and that way the ground's not going to shift under you in the future. Uh, learn to love multi-stage builds, so you can use slim images in deployment whilst you still take advantage of that proven combination in your build process. Uh, rebuild often. Lots of times this will get you security fixes just as part of the build process. And consider moving your pins every once in a while. Upgrading to new versions will also bring in um, more security fixes. And fixing isn't usually very hard. Um, over 40% of Docker image vulnerabilities can usually be fixed by upgrading the base image. And over 20% of them can be fixed just by rebuilding, since a lot of, of, uh, of Docker files will run um, some kind of upgrade during the, the build process. So for our base images, we're trusting an upstream provider. We're going to rely on them for fixes, either by upgrading our base image or by choosing another base image which has less vulnerabilities in it. Um, what about the things that we're adding to the containers ourselves? Anything we add to the base image, that's our responsibility to fix issues in it. So if we just added a package from an upstream distro repository, perhaps we installed an RPM or a DEB as part of our build process, then the same principle exists as with build images. We're not going to start building that package from source to fix a vulnerability in it. We're going to get our friendly upstream maintainer to ship us an upgraded package, or we'll remove that package if we don't really need it. And what about code we're creating? Perhaps we're building uh, containers which have custom applications which we've written in-house and we're packaging them up for deployment into our production environments. Well, for our own applications, um, uh, typically modern apps are based on a small amount of homegrown code and lots of third-party modules or libraries, um, usually open source. Um, this is a pattern you're going to be familiar with if you're developing in Java, in Node, in Python, or in Go. And our application dependencies are typically expressed in a file in our source code. Um, for JavaScript, it might be a, a package.json. For Python, it might be a requirements.txt. But the basic principle is the same. We're defining which dependencies and which versions we need for our particular application. And this isn't a bad thing. Um, having reusable code means we write less code. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we can spend more time on the functionality that we need. But we do need to be aware of what's going on in our image. Each of those, those modules, those packages, can have a large dependency tree, um, potentially bringing in a ton of other stuff that we might not even be aware of. They're just being pulled in because we installed uh, the, the, uh, the thing that, that, um, that depends on them. And these indirect dependencies that we have much less control over, and we might not be aware of them at all. And typically, uh, over 70% of all security vulnerabilities are found in indirect dependencies. And there are a couple of different ways um, that we can deal with vulnerabilities that are being introduced here, depending on the tooling that we're using. Um, here we're looking at a sneak scan of the, the same container image that we started with, and sneaks identified the package.json for our application inside the image. So that gives us a very clear picture of which vulnerabilities are coming from the base image and which are coming from the dependencies of our application. And we can also scan our application directly in the GitHub before it gets included in the base image. And here, Sneak's not only identified vulnerabilities in the package manager, um, but it's also picked up vulnerabilities that would be in the base image um, by using the Docker file. 
um, you know, there are uh, lots of other security tools out there, and most of them will allow you to have this separate view on where the particular vulnerabilities are coming into your into your base image. Whichever way you end up separating out those vulnerabilities, and as I said, it depends on which tool you're using to do your scanning, it's probably not realistic, except for very simple applications, to expect your container image to have no vulnerabilities at all. Um, vulnerabilities themselves aren't a zero-sum game. A particular vulnerability uh, may only be an issue under very specific circumstances, perhaps under on a specific architecture or a specific platform. Um, Without reading the details of every vulnerability, how can we possibly decide what's an issue in our environment or not? Um, security is almost always a series of trade-offs, particularly between effort and risk. How much effort is involved to fix something versus the risk of it being an issue in my particular environment? So we have to make judgment calls on which ones to fix and which ones we might just accept. We don't have endless resources available to spend on fixing things. And so we need to prioritize. Um, unless we want to start digging into each vulnerability and understanding the specific circumstances under which we might be vulnerable, then we have to decide on a strategy. And prioritization isn't an exact science. It can be based on a number of different factors. Um, severity alone doesn't give us very much information other than potential impact. Um, the CVSS score, this is a, a, score, a standard scoring for, for vulnerabilities, it gives us more context, but we can also use information like the maturity of available exploit code, and most importantly, if a fix is available. So a high severity vulnerability, which has an exploit and a fix, are really a no-brainer to fix first. Um, and here's an example of, of what, how the CVSS score is, uh, is put together. So it takes into account exploitability and impact to give us more context. And it provides this in a machine readable format in the vector string, and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, so understanding the output of our tools is also critical here. We need to be able to filter um, based on criteria so we can see the things that we should care about. And most tools will provide you ways of filtering discovered vulnerabilities. Um, uh, in the simplest case, if there's no fix available, for example, then it's likely there's nothing we can do about that issue for the minute. And as I said before, high severity issues, which have a readily available fix are really a no brainer, just apply them. So uh, looking at things in a slightly deeper way, there are obviously elements to this which are um, subjective. Um, so, for example, you may decide that a high severity vulnerability which requires shell access to exploit it is a lower risk in your particular environment because you have other controls in place uh, to protect against shell access. Perhaps you don't have a shell in your containers and you decide that these controls mitigate the risk. Um, this is a more advanced kind of methodology and it is higher risk. So really only go down this road if you're confident that you can make those assessments. Um, and it's obviously a higher effort strategy. So you need to reassess uh, the amount of effort involved versus the amount of risk you might be comfortable with. And uh, again, here, this is where your tools can help. You can usually build filter pipelines based on those CVSS scores. Um, which I showed, uh, as I showed um, a couple of slides ago, provides a lot of information about vulnerabilities in a machine readable format. So I can build um, filters using that, uh, that CVSS um, uh, scoring. But a reasonable strategy might be something like this. Um, no high CVEs in production, uh, nothing with a mature exploit, and to apply all the patches which exist. And if you followed this, it would likely drastically reduce your overall vulnerability count um, in most cases. So now we've considered how we might use a strategy, um, let's take a look at, at how this might work in, in practice. So if we trust our upstream provider, then we're gonna start from a base image, leveraging that upstream provider. And Next, we might have some common configuration for our specific environment. Uh, that, that may well be common to all of our images. 
So this layer plus our original base image would make up our common base image for our organization. And then we might have a, another layer of common software. Perhaps this is a defined set of middleware or specific versions of runtimes for our applications. And finally, we have a layer that adds in our custom code. So the applications that we want to deploy, along with any metadata, application-specific uh, configuration. And based on those defined layers, when we think about vulnerability management within an organization, we want to be able to fix vulnerabilities once and have them effectively resolved everywhere uh, through inheriting those fixes downwards into our distribution tree. And in order to do this, it's important that we understand exactly which layers cause the vulnerability and we only fix it there. So one way to achieve this might be to establish your own base image. So um, here we, we're going to use our, uh, our um, uh, a Python 3.6 Slim as our upstream base image. And um, then we're going to install those perhaps that, that common generic configuration for our environment, um, critical hardening stuff that, that we know we're going to need everywhere. So we're going to build that and establish that as our organizational um, base image. And we can then um, scan that base image and establish a baseline there. So anyone else consuming this only needs to worry about things they've introduced through additional packages or software that they've added. So as we can see here, when we've scanned this base image, we've got um, 178 issues that we know are just in this base image. But um, it's important that we also um, watch out for new things when we're establishing these, these baselines. Um, so we want to be rebuilding and setting a new baseline um, pretty often. So our uh, next image would be our middleware image. And we can see we're going to consume that base image that we talked about a second ago. And we're going to add in our um, middleware, uh, uh, um, our set of middleware um, applications and, and utilities. And then we're going to build that as our middleware image. And so when we test that middleware image, um, we can see that we've got 180 issues in that in that scan. But we know that 178 of those issues were the responsibility of whoever's built our base image. So really, we, our middleware team only need to care about those two new vulnerabilities that have been introduced in that particular, um, in that particular image. And so we can see here that we have uh, vulnerabilities that are the responsibility of the base image team and vulnerabilities that are responsibility of the middleware team. And then finally, on top of that middleware image, we're going to now consume that and we're going to add our application layer into that. And when we go and test um, our uh, final um, app delivery uh, image, um, we can see there's actually no new vulnerabilities been introduced in that layer. So we're, our application team is, is all golden there. And the, the teams that need to uh, be concerned about vulnerabilities are those, those two for the middleware team and those 178 that are in the base image. So um, we can see in those examples how we can uh, create our own set of managed base images and it enables us very easily to see uh, which parts of the image have, 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 um, have had uh, things introduced into them. And as we saw earlier in this talk, we understand um, how to deal with those vulnerabilities that have been created in each of those particular um, image layers. But the final consideration here, of course, is that our containers um, never exist in isolation. Uh, we're typically running our containers in an orchestration system, be that Kubernetes or, or some other mechanism. And so our security is not just based on dealing with vulnerabilities in our applications. Uh, the blast radius of exploits is almost always a combination of application level vulnerability combined with infrastructure misconfiguration. So it's very important that we consider our security as, as multi-layered. 
Um, a container image which causes a single pod to be exploited is clearly not a good thing, but a container image which allows your entire cluster to be owned is a much more significant issue. Um, security principles for Kubernetes are very well documented these days. You definitely do not want to be doing things like in this example, uh, host paths, privileged pods running as root and not setting resource def defaults can all allow an attacker to significantly increase their foothold in your cluster to potentially devastating um, effects. So conclusions from this talk, if all you remember is uh, define your trust boundaries. Um, so understand which bits you're responsible for and which bits you should be looking to your um, upstream providers for. Uh, decide on a strategy. So work out um, a, a, an overall strategy about what things you're going to um, uh, try to fix and follow that all the way through your deployment pipelines and start with the low hanging fruit stuff that has fixes available for it um, are really a no brainer and you should just um, fix them. So thank you for listening. Um, you can sign up for a free account uh, at sneak.io sign up um, and uh, please start scanning your container images for vulnerabilities. Thank you so much, Matt. Pleasure. Yes, um, so I've got a couple of questions. You had me at cake and uh, multi uh, Docker builds, of course, multi-stage. Um, I do have a few questions that are internal. So um, they're wondering that when when you when do you think is the right time to start improving our processes in that particular area so that we can take control of these vulnerabilities? So when do you think is the right time? Uh, well, the right time is always now. <laughs> you mean yeah. if, you mean if you're not scanning at all, right? Yes, so definitely. Yeah, I mean, like I think you know, it's it's. Um, some scanning is always better than than doing nothing right and and security in general doing something is always better than doing nothing um even if you don't uh, have the infrastructure in place to to be able to uh to fix a lot of these things you know at least having visibility is is step one of the process so um start as soon as possible um and uh you know even if you're just scanning at, at build time um, you know that's better than doing nothing. So yes, as soon as as soon as possible is better than than not at all. <laughs> okay. So then the next one is if I'm not just building a POC, should I really be doing this, or should I still be fine if I do it later? Uh, so I I, I think. think... <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good practice to get into the mindset of thinking about security, even if something's not going to production or, you, you know, I mean, I, I've been I've been involved in, in software deployment for a long time. And the, you know, uh, when you the, there are so many things where, you, you know, you, you start off down a route and say, oh, this is just a, a, a test cluster, you know, and then all of a sudden in, in a year's time, it's in production. And then you go, oh, well, I can't, I can't touch that now because it's in production and, you know, there's too many people relying on it. it's too late, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I, would get into the, I, yeah, I would get into the habit of thinking about security, um, you know, all the way through your through your process, even when you're just building things for, from a development perspective, and you know the the tooling that's available now um, is is you know and and uh, uh, Sneak is obviously part of this kind of category is really aimed at at uh, you know um, giving developers insights into these things. You know this is security is no longer about you know an external security team looking at your stuff and deciding you know you can't do it we're all about super fast delivery pipelines now and the only way that we that we can deal with security and move super fast is that we build it into our development process and so you know i i would say um you know find the right tools for you and start using them now you know those those things are designed to be easy to use as part of your development process so you integrate into your uh, source code management system um, the stuff, the CLI tools that, you know, allow you to build automations and integrate with other things. So, yeah, it's uh, I, I would definitely start thinking about security even uh, right at the start of, of any development project. Absolutely, absolutely. Because it also speaks to the maturity of whatever engineering practices that people have in place as well. So I really, really thoroughly enjoyed your uh, talk. I liked the cake picture more because I love food. <laughs> Um, but yes, thank you again for being such a wonderful speaker.
And do stay tuned for the other ones. Thank you again. Thanks.